On September 8, 2022, at 15.10 BST, Elizabeth II, Queen of the United Kingdom and the other Commonwealth realms, and the longest reigning British monarch, died of old age at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, at the age of 96. The Queen's death was publicly announced at 18.30. She was succeeded by her eldest child, Charles III. The death of the Queen set in motion Operation London Bridge, a collection of plans including arrangements for her state funeral, and supported by Operation Unicorn, which set protocols for her death occurring in Scotland. The United Kingdom observed a national mourning period of 10 days. The Queen lay in state in Westminster Hall from 14 to September 19, during which time an estimated 250,000 people queued to pay their respects. The state funeral service was held at Westminster Abbey on September 19, followed on the same day by a committal service at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. The Queen was interred with her husband Philip in the King George VI Memorial Chapel later that evening. The occasion of her state funeral was a public holiday in the UK and several Commonwealth states. The state funeral was one of the United Kingdom's most watched special television broadcasts, surpassing the wedding of Prince William and Catherine Middleton, the previous most watched royal event of the 21st century. Background the Queen was in good health for most of her life, but began to decline after the death of her husband, Prince Philip on April 9, 2021. She began to use a walking stick for public engagements in October 2021. On October 20, the Queen stayed overnight in King Edward VII's hospital in central London, requiring scheduled visits to Northern Ireland and the 26 Colombian Pesos Summit in Glasgow to be cancelled. She also suffered from a sprained back in November which prevented her from attending the 2021 National Service of Remembrance. In February 2022, during the COVID-19 pandemic in England, the Queen was one of several people at Windsor Castle to test positive for COVID-19. Her symptoms were described as mild and cold-like, and she later commented that the disease does leave one very tired and exhausted. The monarch's health became a cause of concern to commentators at this time. The Queen was said to be feeling well enough to resume her official duties by March 1, 2022, and attended the service of thanksgiving for Prince Philip at Westminster Abbey on March 29. Despite this, the Queen did not attend several appointments over the following months, including the annual Commonwealth Day service in March, the Royal Monda service in April the state opening of Parliament in May, and the National Service of Thanksgiving for her Platinum Jubilee in June. During the Jubilee the Queen also suffered discomfort after standing during Trooping the Colour and was largely confined to balcony appearances during the celebrations. Point two days before her death, on September 6, 2022, the Queen accepted the resignation of Boris Johnson and appointed Liz Truss to succeed him as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. These meetings took place at Balmoral Castle, rather than their usual location at Buckingham Palace. On September 7 she was scheduled to attend an online meeting of the Privy Council of the United Kingdom to swear in new ministers in Truss's government, but this was cancelled after she was advised to rest by doctors. The Queen's final public statement, issued that same day, was a message of condolences for the victims of a mass stabbing incident in Saskatchewan. Canada. Death and National Mourning. Death and Announcement. The Queen died at 1510 BST on September 8, 2022, at the age of 96, ending her 70 year reign. Her death was publicly announced at 1830. The death certificate, which gave old age as the cause of death, was made public on September 29. Elizabeth II was the first monarch to die in Scotland since James V of Scotland in 1542. Members of the royal family travelled to Balmoral Castle throughout the day. Prince Charles arrived at 10.30 and was met by Princess Anne who was already staying with the Queen. Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, also travelled to Balmoral from the Burke Hall estate. 
Charles and Anne were by the Queen's side when she died. Prince William, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, and Sophie, Countess of Wessex, left RAF Nordholt on board a flight to Aberdeen Airport and arrived at Balmoral shortly after 1700 hours, while Prince Harry, who had travelled alone and departed later than the other family members, arrived at Balmoral at 20 hundred hours, Catherine and Meghan did not join them. Prime Minister Liz Truss is believed to have been informed of the Queen's declining health that morning by the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, and received an update at 12 o'clock. The leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, was informed by a note passed to him by Deputy Leader Angela Rayner during a speech he was giving in the House of Commons. At 12.30 Buckingham Palace made a public announcement expressing concern for the Queen's health, the Speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, made a brief statement of good wishes in response. Truss was informed at 16.30 that the Queen had died, and the royal family announced her death two hours later via newswires and a post on Twitter. A notice with the same statement was affixed to the railings outside Buckingham Palace and posted on the royal family website. BBC One continuously covered the Queen's condition from 12.40, after the first official statement, and special reports were also run on ITV, Channel 4, and Channel 5. British television announcements of the Queen's death began at 1831 when news presenter Hu Edwards read the royal family's statement during a live broadcast on the BBC News Channel and BBC One. At 18.32 the presenters of BBC Radio 4 and BBC Radio 5 Live made similar announcements. After the announcement, the Union flags at Buckingham Palace and 10 Downing Street were lowered to half-mast. At Balmoral Castle the royal standard of the United Kingdom was lowered and then raised again as the new king was present. The royal banner of Scotland was lowered to half-mast at the Palace of Holyrood House, as was the Welsh flag at Cardiff Castle. Crowds gathered outside royal residences, and rainbows were seen above Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. Scottish Events The Queen's death in Scotland meant that Operation Unicorn was the first part of Operation London Bridge to take effect. The Queen's body was transported to Edinburgh where ceremonial events took place, before her body was transported to London for the state funeral. The Queen's coffin left Balmoral Castle at 10.46 on September 11, draped with the Scottish version of the Royal Standard of the United Kingdom and topped with a wreath consisting of flowers from the castle gardens. The journey of the cortege, which included Princess Anne and Timothy Lawrence, was 175 miles long and passed through Aberdeenshire, Angus, and Fife. People lined the route of the cortege to pay their respects, and in Aberdeenshire farmers formed a guard of honour of tractors. The cortege reached Holyrood Palace at 1623 and the coffin was placed in the throne room. On September 12 the Queen's coffin was carried up the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral in a procession which included the King, Princess Anne, and Timothy Lawrence, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, the bearer party from the Royal Regiment of Scotland, and the Royal Company of Archers. The Queen Consort and the Countess of Wessex followed closely in their car. Guns were fired every minute from Edinburgh Castle during the procession. On arrival the coffin was carried into the cathedral and the crown of Scotland placed on it. A service of thanksgiving was then held to celebrate the Queen's life and highlight her association with Scotland. The service was led by the Rev Callum MacLeod and the homily given by the moderator of the Church of Scotland, the Rev Dr Ian Greenshields. Psalm 118 was sung in Gaelic by Karen Matheson. It was attended by the royal party, politicians, including Liz Truss and Nicola Sturgeon, and representatives from the Queen's Scottish Charities and Organisations. The Queen's coffin lay at rest at the cathedral for 24 hours, guarded by the Royal Company of Archers, which allowed around 33,000 people to file past the coffin. In the evening the King, Princess Anne, Prince Andrew, and Prince Edward held a vigil at the cathedral, a custom known as the Vigil of the Princes 
Princess Anne was the first woman to participate. On September 13, the Queen's coffin was taken by hearse to Edinburgh Airport and flown to RAF Nordholt on a Royal Air Force C 17 Globemaster, accompanied by Princess Anne and Timothy Lawrence. The Royal Air Force bearer party carried the coffin onto the aircraft, and a guard of honour was formed by the Royal Regiment of Scotland. During the journey the Scottish version of the royal standard that draped the coffin was replaced by the royal standard that is used in the remainder of the United Kingdom. Lying in state Upon the Queen's arrival in London, she was transported to Buckingham Palace, before being moved to Westminster Hall the following day for her lying in state before the state funeral. When the Queen arrived at RAF Nordholt the Queen's Colour Squadron assumed the role of the bearer party and formed the Guard of Honour. The coffin was placed in the state hearse and transported through London to Buckingham Palace, with people lining the street to watch. The coffin was then placed in the bar room at Buckingham Palace in the presence of the royal family. The Queen's coffin was taken in a military procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall on a horse drawn gun carriage of the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. The King, male members of the royal family, and Princess Anne followed the coffin on foot. This procession, as well the other processions held later in London and Windsor, marched at the funeral pace of 75 steps per minute and was accompanied by military bands playing marches by Ludwig van Beethoven, Felix Mendelssohn, and Frederick Chopin. Big Ben told each minute of the procession and minute guns were fired from Hyde Park by the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. Members of the three armed forces formed a guard of honour to receive the coffin at Parliament Square, after which soldiers from the Queen's Company, 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, placed the coffin on a catafalque in Westminster Hall. The Archbishop of Canterbury and the Dean of Westminster then conducted a service in the presence of the royal family. The Queen lay in state in Westminster Hall from 1700 hours on September 14 to 6.30 on September 19. The coffin was guarded by members of both the Sovereign's Bodyguard and the Household Division. The imperial state crown and a wreath of flowers and foliage from Balmoral and Windsor castles had been placed on the coffin before the procession, and to these were added the sovereign's orb and the sovereign's scepter with cross, the Wanamaker Cross of Westminster was placed at its head and the regimental flag of the Queen's Company of the Grenadier Guards at its foot. An estimated 250,000 members of the public filed past the coffin, as did politicians and other public figures. Both the BBC and ITV offered a live stream of the Queen lying in state. On September 16, a 28-year-old man was arrested under the Public Order Act after he ran from the queue inside Westminster Hall and touched the coffin. In the evening of September 16, the King and his siblings held a vigil around the Queen's coffin for approximately 10 minutes, and on September 17, the Queen's eight grandchildren did the same. Prince Andrew and Prince Harry were permitted to wear military uniform on these occasions, who as non-working royals had not done at previous ceremonial events. On September 18, pipers at four different locations in Scotland played the immortal memory at 1800 hours. At 20 hundred hours a minute's silence was observed across the UK. The Q. State Funeral Planning Plans for the Queen's death had existed in some form since the 1960s, and the Queen was consulted about all the details included in her funeral plan. The Earl Marshal was in charge of organising the event. The planning and complexity of the funeral was compared to that of Winston Churchill in 1965, the last state funeral held in Britain and also a major international event. It marked the first time that a monarch's funeral service had been held at Westminster Abbey since George II in 1760. The Foreign Office handled the invitations, communications, and security arrangements from a headquarters called the Hangar, redeploying 300 staff to manage the task. 500 foreign dignitaries and heads of state were expected to attend. Invitations were issued to every country with which Britain maintains diplomatic relations, except for Russia, Belarus and Myanmar, Syria, Venezuela and Afghanistan were also asked not to attend. 
The timing of the funeral allowed guests who planned to address the general debate of the UN General Assembly the following day sufficient time to fly to New York. The day of the funeral was a bank holiday in the United Kingdom. Many businesses, workplaces, and educational establishments closed for the day, including major supermarkets and the London Stock Exchange. In the National Health Service, several trusts chose to cancel or reschedule all non urgent appointments. Several food banks announced that they would close on the day of the funeral, though some remained open after facing public backlash. Hotel prices increased in the days before the funeral in London. Extra train services were made available across the country to allow people to travel to and from London and pay their respects for the lying in state and funeral service. Westminster City Council deployed its Clean Streets team to clean up different areas within central London. Procession to Westminster Abbey At 10.44 on September 19 the Queen's coffin was moved from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey on the state gun carriage of the Royal Navy. The carriage was drawn by Royal Navy sailors, known as naval ratings, maintaining a tradition which began at the state funeral of Queen Victoria. The King, members of the Royal Family, and members of the King's household walked behind. Non-working royals, including the Duke of York and the Duke of Sussex, did not wear military uniforms for the state funeral and the committal service. A wreath with foliage cut from the gardens of Buckingham Palace, Highgrove House and Clarence House was placed on the coffin, together with a note from the King which read in loving and devoted memory. Charles R. Before the service the tenor bell of the Abbey rang once a minute for 96 minutes once for each year of the Queen's life. The coffin arrived at Westminster Abbey at 10.52. Funeral Service Music by British composers was played before the service, and as the coffin entered the Abbey the choir sang the five sentences set to music. The service began at 11 o'clock and was conducted by the Dean of Westminster, David Hoyle, according to the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. The lessons were read by Baroness Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, and Liz Truss, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and the sermon and commendation were given by the Archbishop of Canterbury Justin Welby. Prayers were said by clergy from several Christian denominations. The music included the psalm setting like As the Heart by Judith Weir and the Anthem Who Shall Separate Us, by James Macmillan, both written for the funeral as well as pieces performed at the Queen's coronation and wedding. The choir of Westminster Abbey and choir of the Chapel Royal led the singing, and were conducted by James O'Donnell. The end of the service included a sounding of the last post and a two-minute silence, which was concluded with the reveille. The national anthem, followed by the bagpipe lament Sleep, Deary, Sleep, marked the end of the ceremony. The Allegro Maestoso from Elgar's Organ Sonata in G was played after the service. Processions in London and Windsor Two processions followed the service. The first was from Westminster Abbey to Wellington Arch, where the Queen's coffin was placed in the state hearse. From there it was transported to Windsor, where the second procession took place through Windsor Great Park. The procession in London began at 12.15 and included around 3,000 military personnel, stretching for over a mile. It began at the Abbey and passed down Whitehall, through Horse Guards, up the Mall, past Buckingham Palace, and up Constitution Hill to end at the Wellington Arch near Hyde Park around a million people lined the streets of central London to watch the event. At the front of the procession were representatives of Commonwealth forces led by members of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police on horseback, then representatives of the Royal Air Force, the British Army, and the Royal Navy and Royal Marines. Followed by defence staff and armed forces chaplains, officers of arms, and the royal household. The Queen's coffin followed, again on the state gun carriage pulled by Royal Navy sailors, and surrounded by an escort party. The King and royal family members were next, some marching and some in cars, with a further escort and the household of the former Prince of Wales behind. 
At the rear of the procession were representatives of civilian services. Seven military bands were dispersed through the procession and again played funeral marches. Big Ben told each minute and minute guns were fired from Hyde Park by the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. Standards were lowered and those in the procession gave salutes as they passed the cenotaph. At Buckingham Palace, the King's Guard gave a royal salute to the Victoria Memorial and palace staff waited outside the gates. At Wellington Arch the coffin was transferred with a royal salute to the state hearse for the journey to Windsor. The hearse left London for Windsor at 13.30, accompanied by Princess Anne and Timothy Lawrence, travelling on A roads rather than motorways to allow the public to line the route. At 1500 hours the coffin arrived in Windsor, where a final procession involving 1,000 military personnel took place down the long walk to St. George's Chapel. Around 97,000 people lined the route. The Queen's fell pony, Emma, and two royal corgis, Muick and Sandy, stood at the side of the procession. The King and Royal Family joined the procession in the quadrangle, during which Sebastopol Bell and the Curfew Tower Bell tolled and the King's Troop, Royal Horse Artillery, fired minute guns from the east lawn of the castle. At the end of the procession the coffin was taken to St. George's Chapel via the West Steps with the Guard of Honour formed by the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards. Committal Service the committal service began at 1600 hours in the presence of 800 guests, largely made up of the royal household and staff from the Queen's private estates, but also including the royal family, governors general and prime ministers from the Commonwealth realms, and members of foreign royal houses. The choir of St. George's Chapel led the music, which included the Russian Contagion of the Departed, also sung at the funeral of Prince Philip. A selection of music was also played before the service. The Dean of Windsor, who conducted the service, read the bidding, the readings, and the commendation. The first reading was Revelation 21, verses 1 7, which was also included in the order of service for the funerals of Elizabeth's grandparents and father. The rector of Sandringham, the minister of Crathy Kirk, and the chaplain of Windsor Great Park delivered the prayers and the Archbishop of Canterbury gave the concluding blessing. Near the end of the service the imperial state crown, orb, and scepter were removed from the coffin and placed on the altar. The king then placed the Queen's Company camp colour of the Grenadier Guards on his mother's coffin, before the Lord Chamberlain symbolically broke his wand of office and also placed its halves atop the coffin. After this the Garter Principal King of Arms recited the styles of Elizabeth II and Charles III between which a lament a salute to the royal fender smith was played by the sovereign's piper as the queen's coffin was lowered into the royal vault. The singing of the national anthem marked the end of the ceremony. Interment After the funeral of the queen on September 19, she was later interred beneath of King George VI Memorial Chapel in a private service only attended by her closest family at 1930 alongside her father King George VI, her mother Queen Elizabeth, and the ashes of her sister Princess Margaret. The remains of Prince Philip, who was temporarily interred in the royal vault following his funeral in 2021, were interred in the chapel after the interment of the Queen. Elizabeth II's coffin was constructed more than 30 years before the funeral. It is made of English oak and lined with lead to protect it from moisture damage. Due to the weight of the coffin, eight pallbearers were required for lifting and carrying rather than the usual six. Organization and Media Attendees The service at Westminster Abbey was attended by 2,000 people in total, including holders of the George Cross and Victoria Cross, representatives from the United Kingdom's faith communities and foreign and Commonwealth heads of state and heads of government. Representatives from 168 countries, out of 193 UN member states and two UN observer states, confirmed attendance, including 18 monarchs, 55 presidents and 25 prime ministers. Due to the limited number of seats, foreign invitees were asked to keep their delegations as small as possible and to only bring their spouses.
the UK government also requested those travelling by air to use commercial flights, private flights were directed away from Heathrow Airport. Additionally, the government asked guests not to use private cars to travel to Westminster Abbey, and instead use government-provided coach transport from a central assembly point. This was only guidance, leaders including the US President, Joe Biden, the President of Israel, Isaac Herzog, and the Vice President of China, Wang Kishan, were taken to the event through other means. Many dignitaries were present for a reception by the King at Buckingham Palace on the eve of the funeral, and all international guests were invited to attend a reception hosted by the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, after the funeral service. Security Around 10,000 police officers were expected to be on duty every day in London during the morning period, a security operation described by the Metropolitan Police as the biggest the UK has ever seen. Officers from across the country supported the operation under mutual aid agreements. Thames Valley Police announced that they would introduce new water patrols for observing busy waterways in the lead up to the funeral and mounted police officers, police dogs and drones provided part of the security in Windsor. Prior to the service a special unit, the Fixated Threat Assessment Center, began to monitor and review individuals identified as having a potentially dangerous obsession with the British royal family. MI5 and GCHQ worked in collaboration with counter-terrorism police and the Metropolitan Police to provide security for the funeral. A group of 1,500 military personnel was also deployed, and Westminster was inspected by a military wildcat helicopter. Hundreds of stewards from private security firms were hired to aid crowd management. Cost The total cost of the funeral has not been published, but it is expected to exceed the £5.4 million paid for the funeral of Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother. Coverage the funeral and committal service of the Queen were the first to be broadcast to the public. Filming had been prohibited during the state funeral of George VI, although the procession of his coffin was partially televised. United Kingdom Commonwealth and other countries Viewing figures Succession and Four Nation Tour Accession Upon the Queen's death, her eldest child Charles, Prince of Wales, immediately acceded to the throne of the United Kingdom as King Charles III. There was some speculation regarding the regnal name that would be adopted by the former Prince of Wales upon succeeding his mother. During her formal televised address outside 10 Downing Street, Prime Minister Liz Truss made the first mention of the King's regnal name during a tribute to the Queen. Clarence House officially confirmed the new king would be known as Charles III shortly after the Prime Minister's address. Buckingham Palace released the king's first official statement as monarch at 1904. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms, and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. Most of Charles III's pre-accession Scottish titles, as well as the title Duke of Cornwall, were passed to his eldest son and the new heir apparent to the throne. Prince William, Duke of Cambridge. On September 9, William was named Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester, succeeding his father. The Accession Council assembled on 10 September at St. James's Palace to formally proclaim the accession of Charles III. Although about 700 people were eligible to attend the ceremony, because the event was planned on such short notice, the number in attendance was 200. In addition to other formalities, the council confirmed Charles III as the king's regnal name. At 11 o'clock, 21 gun salutes at the Tower of London, Cardiff Castle, Edinburgh Castle, Castle Cornet, Gibraltar, and naval bases and ships at sea marked the accession of Charles III.
The king greeted crowds outside Buckingham Palace after the ceremony. On September 10, senior MPs swore an oath of allegiance to Charles III in a special session of Parliament. The king then met with the Prime Minister for a second time and held audiences with members of her cabinet and leaders of the opposition parties. The coronation of Charles III and Camilla is expected to take place on May 6, 2023, at Westminster Abbey. No plans have been announced for William to be invested as Prince of Wales. Four Nation Royal Tour King Charles III and Queen Camilla travelled from Balmoral to Buckingham Palace where they greeted the crowd of mourners outside the gates. The king then held an audience with the Prime Minister before paying tribute to his mother in a publicly broadcast message. In Charles's first address as king he stated that a national period of mourning would be observed until the day after the state funeral, and an additional seven days would be observed by the royal family, royal household and troops on ceremonial duties. On September 11th, the King met the Commonwealth Secretary-General at Buckingham Palace, after which he hosted the High Commissioners of Commonwealth Realms. On September 12, the King travelled to Westminster Hall with the Queen Consort to receive condolences from the House of Commons and the House of Lords and to give a speech to both houses. He and the Queen Consort then travelled to the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh, where they greeted members of the public and viewed floral tributes before the King inspected the Guard of Honour from the Royal Regiment of Scotland. The ceremony of the keys followed. The King then had an audience at Holyrood House with the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, and the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament, Alison John Stone. The King and the Queen Consort visited the Scottish Parliament to receive a motion of condolence and observed a two-minute silence with MSBs. On September 13, the King and the Queen Consort travelled to Northern Ireland, where they met with members of the public in Royal Hillsborough before arriving at the castle. The King met the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Chris Heaton Harris, and party leaders, and the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Alex Maskey, delivered a message of condolence. The King and the Queen Consort also met with major faith leaders in Northern Ireland. A service of reflection was held in St Anne's Cathedral in Belfast on September 13, where John McDowell, the Archbishop of Armagh and head of the Church of Ireland, paid tribute to the Queen for her efforts in bringing peace to Ireland. The service was attended by the King and Queen Consort, the Prime Minister, the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, and the Dowsiac, Michael Martin. A delegation from the Republican Sinn Féin also attended, but the party did not take part in any events marking the accession. On September 16, the King and Queen Consort visited Cardiff Castle, where a royal gun salute was fired and crowds gathered inside. A silent protest against the monarchy was held outside by groups including trade unions, and labour for an independent Wales. An audience was held for the First Minister of Wales and the LLYWYDD, or Presiding Officer, of the Sindh. A service of prayer and reflection for the life of the Queen was held at Landaff Cathedral on September 16 and attended by the King and Queen Consort. The Bishop of Landaff and leaders of other faiths said the prayers, and the Archbishop of Wales delivered an address in both English and Welsh. The service included the singing of Welsh hymns and anthems. The choir accompanied by harpists Alice Huss and Katrin Finch performed the anthem a Welsh prayer composed by Paul Mealer with words by Graham Davies. At the Senth the King received a motion of condolence before addressing the Parliament in Welsh and English. At Cardiff Castle, the King had audiences with the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, and the LLYWYDD, Ellen Jones. At the castle, they also held audiences with individuals associated with their royal patronages, before meeting with members of the public in the castle grounds. Returning to London, the King met leaders of different faith communities at Buckingham Palace. On September 17, the King met with the Defence Chiefs of Staff at Buckingham Palace and received the Prime Ministers of Australia, the Bahamas, Canada, Jamaica, and New Zealand. The Governors General of the Commonwealth Realms attended a reception and lunch at Buckingham Palace, 
hosted by the king and other members of the royal family. The king met emergency services workers at the Metropolitan Police's Special Operations Room in Lambeth, who were organising aspects of the Queen's state funeral. He also visited the queue with Prince William to speak to its participants. On September 18, the king met the prime ministers of Tuvalu, Antigua, and Barbuda, and Papua New Guinea at Buckingham Palace. A reception for world leaders was held at Buckingham Palace. Other activities On September 10, a service at Crathy Kirk was attended by Anne and her husband Sir Timothy Lawrence, Andrew, Edward, and his wife Sophie, and the Queen's grandchildren Peter Phillips, Zara Tyndall, Beatrice, Eugenie, and Louise Windsor, who then viewed floral tributes outside Balmoral. The King's sons, William and Harry, along with their wives, Catherine and Meghan, viewed floral tributes outside Windsor Castle. On September 15, members of the royal family viewed tributes and met crowds around the UK. The Prince and Princess of Wales visited Sandringham House, the Earl and Countess of Wessex visited Manchester, and Princess Anne and Sir Timothy Lawrence travelled to Glasgow. On September 16, the Prince and Princess of Wales visited the Army Training Centre per Bright to meet with troops deployed from Canada, Australia and New Zealand that would take part in the state funeral. The Earl and Countess of Wessex met with members of the public and viewed tributes at Windsor Castle. On September 17, the Earl and Countess of Wessex met with crowds outside Buckingham Palace. On September 18, the Princess of Wales held an audience with Olena Zelonska, the First Lady of Ukraine. On September 22, the Prince and Princess of Wales visited the Windsor Guildhall and the Princess Royal visited HMNB Portsmouth, respectively to thank volunteers and staff and the Royal Navy for their role in organising the state funeral. Reactions Charles III paid tribute to his darling mama in an address to the UK and Commonwealth on September 9. On September 9, all flags at royal residences were ordered to be lowered to half-mast except the royal standard, which continued to fly at full mast wherever the current monarch was in residence. All royal residences were closed to the public until after the state funeral had occurred. An online book of condolence was set up by the royal website. In a written statement on September 18, the king thanked the public for their support, and a previously unseen photograph of the queen from May 2022 was published by the palace. On September 9, the UK government published guidance on details surrounding the national mourning period stating that businesses, public service, sports fixtures and public venues were not obliged to close. A 96-gun salute was fired in Hyde Park by the King's Troop, Royal Horse Artillery, at the Tower of London by the Honourable Artillery Company, at Edinburgh Castle by the Royal Artillery, at Cardiff Castle and Stonehenge by the 104th Regiment Royal Artillery, at Gernerfon Castle, at York Museum Gardens, and on board Royal Navy ships. Bells tolled at Westminster Abbey, St. Paul's Cathedral, and other churches across the UK, Australia, the Bahamas, and Canada. At Windsor Castle the Sebastopol Bell, which is only rung to mark the deaths of senior royals, tolled 96 times to mark the years of the Queen's life. Politicians throughout the Commonwealth paid tribute to the Queen, praising her long public service. Motions of condolences were also passed in the legislatures of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and Sri Lanka. Political figures in the rest of the world also offered their condolences and tributes, as did members of royal families, religious leaders, and other public figures. A service of prayer and mourning was held at St. Paul's Cathedral at 1800 hours on September 9, attended by senior politicians and 2,000 members of the public. The ceremony marked the first official rendition of God Save the King under Charles's reign. Many organizations paid their respects, and some suspended operations or cancelled events. BBC, ITV, and Channel 4 interrupted television programming to cover the news, while print media dedicated entire front covers in tribute. 
sporting events that went ahead held minute silences. The Queen's death led to debates about the legacy of the British Empire and the abolition of the monarchy in the Commonwealth realms. Other commemorations Instructions to fly national flags at half mast were issued in several countries. In Commonwealth realms like Antigua and Barbuda, Australia, the Bahamas, Belize, Canada, Grenada, Jamaica, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Solomon Islands, national flags were flown at half mast until the date of the funeral, with the exception of Proclamation Day when flags were returned to full mast. Several other countries also issued instructions to fly their national flags at half mast, including Sri Lanka the United States, and many European Union buildings. White flags were also put up in Gaul Face Green and other prominent places throughout Sri Lanka. Several Commonwealth countries also declared the Queen's funeral or a specific day as a national holiday, including Antigua and Barbuda, Australia, the Bahamas, Belize, Canada, the Cook Islands, Nauru, New Zealand, Niu, Papua New Guinea and Sri Lanka. In addition to the service in the United Kingdom, state memorial services were held in several Commonwealth realms, including Grenada and Tuvalu. Thanksgiving and memorial services were also held in Anglican churches across the world, including St. Andrew's Church in Bandar Seri Begawan, Cathedral of Christ the Living Saviour in Colombo, and St. John's Cathedral in Hong Kong. Many landmarks were illuminated in either purple or royal blue colors to honor the Queen, or illuminated with the name or image of Elizabeth II, her royal cipher, or the Union flag, including landmarks in Australia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Brazil, Canada, the Czech Republic, Germany, Israel, Kuwait, New Zealand, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Several landmarks in Canada, France, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom were also dimmed or had their lighting shut off as a sign of respect. Moments of silence were held across several Commonwealth realms. Several institutions also held moments of silence, including the Dale Aran, the Parliament of Sri Lanka, and by the Airborne Commemorations Foundation in the Netherlands. Flowers, tributes, and wreaths were left at British embassies including Berlin and Jakarta. Antigua and Barbuda Antigua and Barbuda hosted a service of thanksgiving in honor of the late Queen of Antigua and Barbuda on September 19, which was declared a public holiday throughout the country. The Governor-General's deputy, Sir Clare Roberts, and the acting Prime Minister Steedroy Benjamin presided in the absence of Sir Rodney Williams and Gaston Brown who were both present at the Queen's State Funeral in London. The service took place at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine and was officiated by Dwayne Cassius, Dean of the Cathedral of the Anglican Diocese of the North East Caribbean in Aruba. The service was followed by a parade of members of the Antigua and Barbuda Defence Force and the Royal Police Force of Antigua and Barbuda. The parade commenced from the Long Street entrance of the cathedral and concluded at the Apua Telephone Exchange, where the parade was dismissed. Australia A 96-gun salute was fired by Australia's Federation Guard on the forecourt of Parliament House in Canberra on September 9 to mark the passing of the Queen of Australia. Monuments and landmarks across the country were lit up to honour the Queen. The Sydney Opera House was illuminated with an image of Queen Elizabeth II on the nights of 9 and September 10, as a symbolic gesture on behalf of the Government of New South Wales. The Australian Parliament House was lit up with images of the Queen throughout her seven-decade reign, reflecting her long and deep relationship with Australia. The Government of Western Australia also announced that landmarks across Perth, the capital city of Western Australia, would be illuminated royal purple as a mark of respect for the Queen. A national memorial service for the Queen took place on September 22 at Parliament House in Canberra. The National Day of Mourning was observed as a one-off public holiday. 
one minute's silence was observed at 11 o'clock across Australia. Plans were announced for a new public square in central Sydney bearing the late Queen's name. Bahamas A state memorial service for Elizabeth II, Queen of the Bahamas, was held at Christ Church Cathedral in Nassau on October 2. A procession of parliamentarians and law enforcement officers preceded the service, which started at Rawson Square, Bay Street. Governor-General Sir Cornelius A. Smith, and Prime Minister Philip Davis were among those who addressed the congregation. Bhutan Upon royal command, special prayers were performed in all major tsongs, temples and monasteries across Bhutan. King Jigme Kesar Namjil Wangchuk and Queen Jetson Pema offered 1,000 butter lamps at Samtsi on September 9 for Elizabeth II. Special prayers to offer light were held at the ceremony, which was attended by the Prime Minister, government officials and thousands of people in Samtsi. Thongdrals of Guru Rinpoche and Zabdrung were unfurled for the ceremony, to sanctify the important occasion. In Thimphu, Former King Jigme Sinjai and members of the royal family were joined by government officials and foreign dignitaries to offer 1,000 butter lamps and prayers at the Grand Canary of the Tashik Hadzong. Canada Various locations were illuminated in honour of the late Queen of Canada as a part of the Department of Canadian Heritage's National Illumination Initiative. The Canadian government also announced a donation of 20 million cordobas to the Queen Elizabeth Scholars Program a program that funds Canadian university exchange programs. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced that the date of the Queen's funeral would be a holiday for federal government employees. Among the Canadian provinces and territories, Prince Edward Island was the only one to declare the date of Elizabeth II's funeral a statutory holiday. Alberta, the Northwest Territories, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec declared a day of mourning or commemoration instead of a holiday. In the remaining provinces and territories government offices closed, some also closed schools, and observance was optional for private sector businesses. The Retail Council of Canada and Canadian Federation of Independent Business were against making the funeral a statutory paid holiday. A national commemorative ceremony for Elizabeth II took place at the Christ Church Cathedral in Ottawa on September 19, which was broadcast live on television as well as on social media. The ceremony was preceded by a parade of the Canadian Armed Forces and Royal Canadian Mounted Police through downtown Ottawa from Cartier Square Drill Hall and past Parliament Hill to the Cathedral, with a 96-gun salute. A fly passed by the Royal Canadian Air Force was cancelled due to inclement weather. The congregation was addressed by former Governor-General Adrian Clarkson as well as former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Provincial commemorative services took place in several Canadian provinces on September 19 in Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and Labrador, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Saskatchewan. In Ontario, a memorial service was held in Toronto on September 20. Two memorial services in Quebec were organized by the Anglican Church rather than the provincial government, which would be attended by Lt. Gov. Michel Doyen. Moments of silence were held across several provinces on September 19, with several transit operators having paused their operations for 96 seconds to coincide with the provincial moment of silence. Two British-made bronze cannons from 1810 were fired in Westmount, Quebec, in honor of Elizabeth II. Fiji the Holy Trinity Anglican Cathedral in Suva hosted a special service of remembrance and thanksgiving on September 16 in memory of the Queen. The service was attended by hundreds, including President Ratu Wiliami Katanavir and First Lady Philomena, Parliament Speaker Ratu Epili Nailatiko, Minister for Health Ifarimi Wakina Bet, former Prime Minister Sidavini Rabuka, Police Commissioner Brigadier General Sidavini Kiliho, Head of the Catholic Church in Fiji Archbishop Peter Loi Chong, members of the diplomatic corps and the public. During the service, 
the Republic of Fiji Military Services accorded the last post, signaling the end of the Queen's 70-year reign. On September 20, President Ratu Wiley Amikatanavir hosted a commemoration and thanksgiving service for the Queen at State House in Suva, which was attended by senior officials, government ministers, members of parliament and foreign representatives. The President reflected on the Queen's six visits to Fiji, which he said symbolized strong solidarity between Fiji and the royal family. France French Postal Service Law Post issued a book of four collector stamps featuring the Queen. 50,000 stamps were put on sale on the day of the Queen's funeral. Starting from October 14, L.E. Tuquet's local airport was renamed L.E. Tuquet Paris Plage Elizabeth II to honor the Queen. In Paris, the George V Metro Station, on Line 1 under the Champs Elysees, was renamed Elizabeth II for the day of the Queen's state funeral. Hong Kong Thousands in Hong Kong paid tribute to the Queen, who was the colonial head of the city for 45 years before handover in 1997. Long queues were seen outside the British consulate for days after the announcement of the death and until the funeral, with mourners waiting up to four hours. More than 13,000 signed the condolence books in the consulate in 11 days, eulogising the boss lady an affectionate nickname for the Queen by the Hong Kongers. The tribute, which was one of the largest public gathering after imposition of the national security law and the crackdown on democracy movement, was also regarded as a protest to Hong Kong and Chinese authorities and mourning the past. Eric Chan, chief secretary for administration and second highest ranking official in the city, visited the consulate and signed the condolence book on behalf of the government. Nevertheless, the pro-Beijing newspapers accused a minority of Hong Kong mourners for indulging in this fantasy that they are subjects of the British Empire, and called for the eradication of colonialism. On the day of the Queen's funeral, hundreds gathered outside the consulate watching live footages. A harmonica player was arrested under colonial-era sedition law after playing Glory to Hong Kong, an iconic protest song, and God Save the King. Jamaica. A 96 gun salute was fired by the Jamaica Defence Force at Up Park Camp in St Andrew on 19 September. A national memorial service for the late Queen of Jamaica was held on 2 October at the St Andrew Parish Church, Indiana Kingston, and was attended by government officials and foreign representatives. The service was headed by Governor General Sir Patrick Allen, Prime Minister Andrew Holness, and Mark Golding the leader of the official opposition, headed the service. The service included scripture readings by the Governor-General, the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition, as well as tributes and songs by the Church Choir and the Kingston College Choir. Apart from the National Memorial Service in Kingston, services were held on October 2 in Clarendon, St. Catherine, St. Anne, Portland, St. Mary, St. Thomas, St. Elizabeth, St. James, Westmoreland, Hanover, Manchester, and Trelawney. The custodes and mayors headed the memorial services in parishes across Jamaica. Kenya In Kenya, former staff returned to the Treetops Hotel the building where Elizabeth learned about the death of her father and her accession to the throne, to light candles and lay out a condolence book. New Zealand A 96-gun salute was fired from the T.E. Papa Promenade in Wellington on September 9, by personnel from the 16th Field Regiment, Royal New Zealand Artillery based at Linton Military Camp to mark the passing of the Queen of New Zealand. A state memorial service with a one-off public holiday took place on September 26 to celebrate the life and reign of Queen Elizabeth II of New Zealand. The service took place at the Wellington Cathedral of St. Paul at 1400 hours and was televised and live-streamed. A national minute of silence took place at the beginning of the service, with people across New Zealand being invited to participate in the moment of silence. During the service, the Queen's personal New Zealand flag was paraded for the last time. Memorial services were also held elsewhere in New Zealand, including in Auckland, Christchurch, New Plymouth, and Hastings. South Canterbury Anniversary Day, 
which was due to be observed on September 26 in the Damaru, Waymet and Mackenzie districts, was moved to Friday, November 11. Cook Islands New Papua New Guinea On September 12, a 96-gun salute was fired in honour of the Queen, and a moment of silence took place outside Parliament House in Port Moresby. On September 18, members of various Anglican church parishes in Port Moresby gathered at St. Martin's Anglican Parish for a memorial service for the late Queen of Papua New Guinea, which was presided over by the Bishop of Papandota, Lindsley I. Hove. St. Lucia On September 9, a 96-gun salute was fired by the Royal St. Lucia Police Force on the premises of Government House in Castries. On September 19, the day of the state funeral, the public was invited to pause for a 72nd national tribute to reflect on the life and legacy of Elizabeth II, Queen of St. Lucia. Church bells and sirens from fire stations throughout the nation sounded for 1 minute and 10 seconds starting at 9.59 to herald the commencement of the 72nd reflection period at 10 o'clock. Slovakia A place of remembrance for Elizabeth II was created by server E.T. Mainera in the Carl Gustav Swenson Park in Ilina. The memorial is located near the first tree planted for the Queen's Green Canopy in Central Europe. In the biblical garden at Vizaka Nad Kaisoku, Elizabeth II was publicly honoured with the planting of the Queen Elizabeth Rose. The rose planting was a part of the official opening for the gardens and was organised by the Vizaka Nad Kaisoku Parish in cooperation with server E.T. Mainera. Solomon Islands In the Solomon Islands the Prime Minister declared 12-14 September as days of mourning, and the first a public holiday. The three-day national mourning period began on September 12 with a wreath-laying and signing of the condolence book at Government House by national leaders including Governor-General Sir David Vunaghi, Prime Minister Manassas Sogavayer, Speaker of the National Parliament Patterson Odi and Chief Justice Sir Albert Palmer, as well as other government officials, former Governors-General and Prime Ministers members of diplomatic missions and uniformed groups. A memorial church service was held at the St. Barnabas Anglican Cathedral on September 14 to celebrate the life and reign of Elizabeth II, Queen of Solomon Islands. The service was attended by Acting Governor-General Pattison John Odi, Prime Minister Manassas Sogavayer, Deputy Speaker Commons Miwa, Chief Justice Sir Albert Palmer, former Governors-General, Acting British High Commissioner Steve Ald and senior government officials. Sweden Sweden honoured the Queen, who was one of the longest-serving members of the Royal Order of the Seraphim, the foremost order of Sweden, on the day of her funeral on September 19. The Queen was awarded the order by King Gustav VI Adolf on May 26, 1953 and the chain of the order was given to her by King Carl XVI Gustav on May 23, 1975. The Queen was the 722nd member of the order since its inception in 1748. The Queen's royal coat of arms as a member of the Royal Order of the Seraphim was then taken in procession from the palace to Riddar Hallman Church in Stockholm, where the Borden rang a traditional Seraphim toll for one hour. The arms were then hung in the church. By command of the King of Sweden, flags above royal residences were flown at half-mast on the day. United Kingdom United States Billboards on the Las Vegas Strip showed images of the Queen. On September 21, a memorial service was held at the Washington National Cathedral, arranged in conjunction with the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. Attendees included Vice President Kamala Harris. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, as well as British Ambassador Karen Pierce. All living former U.S. presidents were invited, but none attended. A sermon was delivered by Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church.